It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you all here for the return engagement of Tamara Telesco, who came to us a year ago and gave such a great presentation. We all learned so much, we needed to find out more. Okay, sorry, Peter. Um, she is Senior Director in Wealth Planning Strategies at TIAA. She's an attorney. Uh, she has a very low profile on the internet, I discovered. Obviously, she's a private person, but I did some sleuthing, <laughs> and I found that she uh, has a law degree from the University of Pittsburgh, and that she uh, was formerly uh, a, a vice president uh, at Chase Manhattan. She was director of wealth planning for Morgan Stanley. Um, she was an account manager with ACO, a Goldman Sachs company. Uh, she lives in New Jersey. She has two sons and apparently a Labrador retriever. Uh, and her topic today is taxing matters, estate planning, and the new SECURE Act. So I turn it over to you, Tamara. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure whether a lot of you are aware or not. Okay. Yep, I did do that one. Okay. Everyone can hear me, right? I have a loud voice anyway. I usually don't need a microphone, let me tell you. But um, on January 1st, a new tax law went into effect called the SECURE Act. And the SECURE Act, I think, affects everyone in this room because it is the biggest change in retirement plans in about 10 years. 10 years, 15 years. So I was gonna go over that a little bit, tell you, it, it deals a lot with um, making more accessibility to retirement plans in general. So there's a lot of issues with, you know, what companies can have, 401ks, those kind of things. I'm not gonna dwell on that because that really doesn't apply to us, but the individual um, aspects of this um, tax law do apply to everyone in this room, because I dare say everyone in here has retirement plans, and I would venture to say a good portion of your estate are, are, is in retirement plans. So I wanted to go over a little bit about what it is. We're gonna talk about the SECURE Act. Uh, we're gonna go over the federal income and estate tax laws. Um, go over a little bit of inheritance laws. I touched on that briefly last time. And if you have any questions, just interrupt me. I'm more than happy to answer them if I can. So SECURE stands for, get a load of this, setting every community up for retirement enhancement. That's a real stretch. That's a real stretch if you ask me. This is the House bill that ended up eventually passing. Both the House and the Senate had a bill and um, the House bill was the one that actually this, the two of them evolved into. It's much more the House than the Senate bill. So what affects individuals in this bill is, first of all, uh, contributing to an IRA. If you still work and you have income, it used to be a cutoff when you could contribute to an IRA. Now there's no cutoff. So if, as long as you have earned income, you can contribute to it. You still have to take out distribution, so it's in and out, but it does give you that option of saving up more if you want to. So that's one of the um, ones that affects individuals. The other one is if you were not age 70 and a half by the end of last year, 70 and a half was always that magic age when you had to start taking required minimum distributions from your IRAs. If you were not 70 and a half by the end of last year, you now can defer taking required minimum distributions until age 72. If you now, if you're still working Obviously, with IRAs, you have to take them out. You don't have to with your retirement accounts at Columbia. But on the IRAs, there's always mandatory distributions. Now it is at age 72. If 
you were in that age group between 70 and a half and 72, which would be about 71 if my math's right, um, you, uh, if you were not 70 and a half, you, have to, you can defer taking until 72. If you were 70 and a half, you don't get two years extra. I just want to emphasize that, but that was a change too. The one that I think affects you most are stretch IRAs. The way IRAs work, and they always did work, is if you named a spouse as your beneficiary, the spouse could roll it over into their own IRA and take out distributions over their life expectancy. That's still the law. That did not change. What changed is when an IRA goes to a non-spouse. And that non-spouse can be children, that non-spouse can be a friend, it can be anyone. But from now on, non-spouse inherits an IRA, and there are a few exceptions which I'll go over. Uh, they have to take out the entire distribution within 10 years. But it's different from required minimum distributions. Required minimum distributions, you were taking them out every year and there was a, a, a slice of that IRA. You had to take out every year. It didn't matter, you know, you could always take more, but you had to take that little one. For a non-spouse, it's not required to take out any distribution until the 10th year. So in the first year, you might want to take, uh, you know, the beneficiary may want to take something out. They don't have to take it out for another five years. They can take it out again in year seven, nothing. But by year 10, the entire thing has to be taken out. So it kind of shifts planning from estate planning to, can you hear me, or is that, okay. From estate planning to income tax planning, right? Because now the beneficiary, let's say you have a million dollar IRA, which probably many of you in this room have, right? If they take it out over 10 years, think about it, that would be $100,000 every year, right? Instead of you know, stretching it out and maybe they're taking out 30,000, you know, 36,000, whatever. So it's a big difference for the beneficiary and their income taxes. Now, what can you do about it? Well, you know, the, there's several things that people are commenting about that you may want to consider. Does anybody have any questions about that, by the way, before I get started? So, a, the exceptions to this rule are surviving spouses, disabled, a beneficiary that is 10 years or less than the original person. Those are the exceptions that you have for um, the uh, non-spouse inherit or the spouse inheriting. And a minor child is also an exception but it's only an exception until they reach majority. Oh, just think about it. If any of you named a grandchild, for example, and the grandchild is not a child, that's not an exception, so that person would have to start taking distributions over 10 years. If you named your child and the child was a minor, then they could take out minimum distributions over their life expectancy, which would be very small, as you can imagine. But once they e reach 18 or 21, whatever the state ma age of majority is, then they have to take it out over 10 years. So think about it. Somebody that's 18, if you name them as beneficiary on your IRA, is going to have to take everything out by the time they're 28. So that's a big difference than what it was over the life expectancy. So I wanted you to, you know, to just be aware of that change because that's significant. Now, what you can do is name a trust as beneficiary for that child, for example. But it can't be a conduit trust. There are two types of trusts that IRAs can be the beneficiary of. One are conduit trusts, and that's the ones that if you've named a trust as beneficiary, 
is probably the one that you have in place. A conduit trust forces out all income. So if there was any kind of income in that year, that child is going to be getting it. And they forced it out because it was required, right, under required minimum distributions. What you can have is what's called an accumulation trust. So if you have a beneficiary that you don't, or that maybe you want asset protection for, you maybe don't want them to get this money right away in their own hands, then an accumulation trust will pay, then the trustee has the discretion whether to give money out to the beneficiary or not, and if they don't, it accumulates in the trust. Bad thing about that is trusts have a different tax, much more compressed bracket. If you look, when we get into the income tax, I mean, you could make 400, 500,000 and you're still not in the top bracket. With trusts, it's like 14,000 and you're in the top bracket. So it's the same brackets, they're just compressed. So again, you're balancing income taxes against estate taxes, against inheritance, all of that with this new tax law. So I wanted you to be aware of it because it's, it is a significant change from what was previously. Anybody have any questions? I have a question about the first thing you said about the possibility of contributing to an IRA if you're still employed. Mm -hmm. uh, is there no income limit on beyond which you can contribute? I mean, there is none. So, I mean, if you're making a million dollars a year, you can, what, what percentage can you give? You can give up to 6,000. Yeah, it's the 6,007. Six, six, yeah. Okay. It's not significant, but right. you know, if you wanted to defer, it's not going to be tax deductible no. if you make you're in the high brackets. Okay, right. so just so you're aware of that. Anything else anybody wanted to know about the Secure Act or had questions on it or were aware of it? Okay, so we can go on to estate planning. Um, uh, these are some of the other ones. Um, now you can just, it, it, and I just have them up here. They allow more retirement accounts to have annuities, um, increased information. The SECURE Act requires retirement plan administrators to provide annual lifetime income disclosure statements. Um, there is one here that may apply, I am not sure. Um, one is if you know anyone that has a 529 plan and they have student debt, they can actually use 10,000 of that to repay debt. It's a one-time 10,000 to repay debt. That's something that may help some of the students. Is if you have a child. If you have a child uh, within the year the child is born, you can take out $5,000 from the retirement account to pay, for, uh, 529 plan to pay for expenses associated with that child, and that includes adoption expenses. So again, I'm not sure that pertains to too many, but it is something new that was in the law. So we talked about, uh, how many were here last time? A few of you? Okay, let me, I, I apologize, but I'm gonna go over some of the items that we uh, were talked about last time, just so everybody's on the same page. It's interesting for you to know how um, your assets are distributed. If you're the sole owner of assets, you have community property, or you own it jointly as tenants in common, those go by your will. So if you have a will, those are what goes through your will to the beneficiary. On the other hand, if you have retirement accounts that we just talked about, trust property, life insurance, anything with a beneficiary designation, the beneficiary designation supersedes your will. So it's very, very important to check your beneficiary designations especially on your retirement accounts. Because under the SECURE Act, if you name your estate as beneficiary on your retirement accounts, the beneficiary, it's gonna go through your will. It's not gonna go, it's, it's the estate is your will. It's gonna go through your will and eventually end up to your beneficiaries. They're gonna to have to take it out within five years. So it's a penalty 
for naming the estate as the beneficiary. So if you leave nothing, and I said this last time, if you know nothing else from my talk, make sure that you do not name an estate as the beneficiary on a retirement because it could actually mess up what you really want to accomplish in your estate plan. If you name a person, again, the surviving spouse can roll it over. If somebody's disabled, the probably a special needs trust would be implemented. They could take it over their life expectancy. A minor could take it over their life expectancy <coughs> until a certain age when they reach majority. Um, but if you name the estate, it's going to go through the will, and whoever gets it has to take it out within five years. So make sure... It, it, the only exception to that may be if you name charities. If your whole estate goes to charities, it really doesn't matter because it's going to go and there's no estate tax consequences. Yep? But what if you name one of your deceased relatives in a trust? Pardon me? If you name one of the deceased If it's a designated beneficiary, if it's, if it's a child, then that's okay. Yep, that is okay. Yep, that's an exception to it. You're right. Um, the other one that is going to go outside of your will are joint tenant property with right to survivorship. Many of you may own a home joint with right to survivorship. That's automatically going to go to whichever one of you survives. You could own a bank account. That's going to go whichever one of you survives. Um, transfer and death are payable. If you have a bank account, Let's just say everything you own are retirement accounts. So you have beneficiaries on everything. So they're getting everything. And you have a bank account, right? Now, if you don't have you know, a bank account and it's in your sole name, that's the only thing that goes through probate. And I'll go through what probate is. But if you don't want it to go through probate, and many people don't, and I'll give you reasons why, the pros and cons, um, you can put on your bank account what's called a TOD or a POD. A TOD is transfer on death. A POD is payable on death. What those are are beneficiary designations on non-retirement accounts. So you're basically putting a beneficiary designation on an account that normally doesn't have a beneficiary on it, and it will avoid probate, go directly to the person that you name. You can get those from the bank. So if you have an account at Chase, you have an account at City, wherever, you can ask for a TOD or a POD, and at your death, that will go directly to the person. If not, it goes to probate. So what's probate? Probate in New York is done by the surrogate's court. The surrogate's court requires that if you have a will, what happens is your executor, whoever you have named, and normally there's an attorney behind you doing a lot of this work. But in general, if you're doing it yourself, you present your copy of your will or the deceased will with a death certificate and a listing of the assets, right? Present that to the surrogate's court. In return, the, the judge, the surrogate's court, gives you back what are called letters testamentary. Letters testamentary are what allows the executor to transfer that bank account from the deceased name to your name. Sounds easy, right? The issue is you're not the only one that died, right? The judge has tons of people that passed away and goes through the lists. And unfortunately, there's a time delay with that. And the estate is frozen until you get those letters testamentary. So most people try to avoid probate. Now, ways to do that, as I mentioned, are beneficiary designations, payable on death, um, joint property, we'll all do that. But when there's only one surviving person, so you don't have joint property or you don't have, you know, what, what do you do? If you're a single individual, what you may want to consider doing is a revocable trust. A revocable trust is a will substitute. You still will have a will, but instead of your will giving your jewelry, tangible personal property, your residence and all of that, and going through probate, while you are alive, you retitle those assets in the name of the trust. 
you're your own trustee. So you're not giving up any control, but what it does do is it eliminates probate because trusts are not subject to probate. Now, why does everybody in this room probably have a will and they don't have a revocable trust? How many have a revocable trust? Do I have it? Oh, okay, we have a few. They're not common in New York because many, many, many moons ago, and I mean many, many moons ago, maybe before Frank was even born, <laughs> you could not, that was a joke, <laughs> you could not be your own trustee while you were alive. So who's, giving up, who's going to give up control of all their assets? Nobody. So we just never drafted them in New York. And Connecticut was the same, and New Jersey was the same. So around this tri-state area, everyone really does have a will. If you move to Florida, if you move to California, if you move to Texas, if you move almost anywhere outside of these three states, everybody avoids probate. I mean, you, it, and uses revocable trust. You can imagine in Florida, the amount of older people that live there, and they clog, the, the courts are extremely clogged. The, the probate courts are extremely clogged. So everybody tries to avoid probate by doing revocable trust. They don't save on taxes, and I want to emphasize that, but they do save on probate. There is a slight cost to probate too, but I don't think that's a big deal. I mean, in New York, they, I, they charge by the page. It's not a big deal. So it's not really the cost to me. It's more the inconvenience of having the um, estate held up and not being able to distribute the assets to whom they belong. <laughs> what is the typical delay? What is the typical delay? Could be six months. Depends on how complex. If it's just, you know, retirement assets and everything, it's probably about six months. The surrogates court lately has not rehired judges. Yeah, I know, that surprises you, right? That, that definitely. So there is actually a shortage of judges in the court, but I would say six. But when you get, you know, like big businesses, like you know, a, a corporation, or you know, I shouldn't say big businesses, but a corporation, somebody owns a business, those get more complex because they have to do valuations, et cetera. But it would basically be six months. Nine months from date of death, you have to pay all your taxes. So whether you get everything shifted over in the right name or not, you know, if there's any taxes due, you do owe those. Anything else, Tom? Uh -huh. So um, revocable trusts are still not possible in yeah. Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey? I'm sorry, where, who's talking? I'm sorry. Revocable trusts are still not possible in New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York? And no, you, you can't do them. I just With said yourself as trustee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the self the self instructed ones you can do now, but it was many moons ago ah, you couldn't. Okay. That's why. But I would recommend anyone that's single to do it because what other what else is good about a revocable trust is, you can name a successor trustee or you do name a successor trustee. So while you're alive and you're capable of managing everything, it's not going to be any different. You're going to get a bank account that says Tamara Telesco, trustee of the Tamara Telesco Revocable Trust. That's all. It still has my Social Security number on, still has everything. So nothing has changed. But wonder if you get disabled. Wonder if you get Alzheimer's. Wonder if you're slipping. Wonder if you just don't want to do it anymore and you want, you know, somebody else to take care of it. Obviously, it has to be somebody you trust. Usually, it's a relative of some type. But you can name a successor trustee that just steps in your shoes and can handle your affairs. Now, you can, it, you can do that through power of attorney also, and I'm sure many of you in this room have a power of attorney. The problem is with a lot of banks, and there's articles in the New York Times, uh, I can give you with Wells Fargo and a lot of the banks, they have their own power of attorney. So they want you to go into their bank and sign their power of attorney to, you know, in case you become disabled. If you don't have it, then it has to, your power of attorney has to go through their legal department and it just takes time. So a revocable trust kind of eliminates that because a trustee just steps in the shoes and has the power to exercise. There's nothing that the bank or any institution is reviewing. Mm -hmm.
Uh, TOD goes fast. Yeah, that goes fast. And I always think that's a better way of doing it because your estate's going to need some money anyway. The survivor, if there's a surviving spouse, they're going to need some money. So if it's not a joint account or the child, whatever, they need some money to just, you know, funeral expenses, everything. That just goes with the death certificate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've read that a surprising number of adults who should know better die in test and I never do get around. Oh, I've, I've read that a, surviving, a surprising number of adults who should know better um, never do get around to writing a will, and they die in test aid. And I'm just curious, uh, what's your observation of that? Is there a correlation with anything special in people's lives or, or demographic or sociological Well, don't factors? you think people don't think they're ever going to die? Or if their mother, no. mother or father is still alive, that's, that's a real stumbling block. Believe me, it truly, truly is. I run across it all the time, and it, I can't give you a common theme. It's people with a lot of wealth. It's people with no wealth. I, it, it's, it's, it's frustrating. It really is. And there's no sense of urgency either. You know, you really have to put a fire under them. And normally what happens is when they realize all the probate, if it goes through intestacy, the intestacy laws in New York is if you have a surviving spouse, they get $50,000 plus, you know, a third of your estate. If you have children, they get a portion. And when they realize how the state would be distributed, if they didn't have a will, sometimes that makes it. But it is true. It's absolutely true. And I don't usually mention it because nobody would believe me. But it is true. They it is happened. Does a joint bank account have to get the probate? No. No. As long as it's joint with right to survivorship, and most married people have joint right to survivorship. Yep. That's a good way of avoiding. If all your assets are owned jointly, no probate. No probate at all. Uh huh. Yep, you, I you put, put your nephew's nephew. name on my significant bank account after someone spoke here a year. Oh, good. Did it work? Did they get did They told me that um, as soon as I die, you can't take anything out of it. Uh, well, and you give the death certificate and everything, and then he, he's able to have access so, to it. But I can also, I'm better off also adding a revocable trust. And then I think the revocable trust makes sense because that doesn't go through probate, and the trustee just comes in and, and distributes the assets. Is yeah. there any easy form online we can get this at? If you go to uh, the New York Bar Association, okay, yeah. they have a lot of, um, it's, it's newyorkbar.org. Uh, uh, they have a lot of uh, free forms. They have powers of attorney, living wills, right. they have sample wills, mm -hmm. sample revocable trusts. Yep. They did, they didn't do change it. But um, someone just mentioned payable on death at a bank account. That's not valid or? We can, we can do payable on death on, at a bank account? Yes. Or? Okay. You can do payable and on death. Yep. Fill that up in the bank. POD okay. or TOD. Thank some, you. It, they just refer to them different ways. Anything else? Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, Jace has changed her policy, and they now accept Jace has changed policy. What? Okay. Jace just changed its policy, and they now accept powers of attorney that aren't different from their That's own fantastic. Yeah. Maybe we complained enough, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think they all accept them. It's just a matter that they have to go through their legal department. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. that process at Chase works really fast now. Good. That's good to know. I will add that in the next one. That's good to know. Because it has been a nightmare a lot of times. So thank you. That's good to know. Anything else? Um, if you raise it with this. Um, what steps? does one take to get the bank to retitle assets if you're doing a revocable trust? Is that complicated? Oh, you just do a form. Yeah, their it's form, all, yeah. Their form. Their, <laughs> it, well, I mean, you want to retitle it in the name, so you're going to get a new set of checks. So, you know, whatever you have, the normal process of opening up an account, you're opening up an account now a Jewish trustee rather than just you. That's all. You can keep, usually you can keep the same check numbers, too. It's just in retitling. 
That may be different in every institution. I don't know. You, you, did you, you don't have a revocable trust. You just used a power of attorney. Okay. Yeah. Uh, am I right in assuming that you're not advocating that we not have wills if we have revocable trusts? Well, you're always going to have a will. Okay. <laughs> the will is going to be, a, I started and then I got distracted. Okay. When you have a revocable trust, you still have a will because chances are you're not going to retitle everything, right? You're going to have a car, you're going to have personal property, although that's usually in there, but something's going to be missing, a bank account or something. So you will still have a will, but the will is called a pour over will. And literally it's three pages. And it will state your name, you'll probably name an executor, and it says anything I haven't titled in the name of my revocable trust while I was alive passes to my revocable trust. It's a catch-all. So in case there is anything that is missing. And if there is anything that's missing, that will go through probate, right? Because it has to go through probate to the, to the revocable trust. But if you title all of your accounts in your name, when you pass away, that trust, now that trust is revocable, which means you, you can change it at any time. It is like a will, it's a will substitute. But once you pass away, it becomes irrevocable, and then the trustee takes over and distributes assets. Okay? We got that? But make sure you do not name, I'm going to say this 15 times, the estate as beneficiary on any of your retirement accounts. That is definitely a no-no, unless you're leaving your entire estate to charity, which in, in that case, it doesn't matter. Um, joint accounts avoid probate but they go outside your will. So to your point, if you have a nephew and you put him on the bank account, but in your will or your revocable trust, you leave everything to your niece, your nephew's going to get that account. If it's a POD, a TOD, or joint, that supersedes your will, as do retirement, beneficiaries on retirement accounts. That supersedes your will. So you have to make sure they're coordinated is one thing. Uh-huh. So if you wanted the ass retirement assets to go to charities, uh, would you want them to wind up in the estate and then be distributed to the charities, or would you want to put long lists of charities as beneficiaries on the accounts? I think the latter would probably be preferred. And it doesn't matter how long the list. I mean, really, that you know, then they just get it directly. Again, if it goes through probate, then they your executor is going to distribute it. Uh, in New York, just as an FYI, uh, there is an executor fee, a statutory. I think it's the only state that actually has a statutory fee. I know, surprise, surprise, again, right? It's and if you name multiple executors, many of you. And I, sa I think I said this last time, if you have two or three children or two or three nephews and you, you, don't, you don't know which one to pick, I always say pick the one you like the least because it's a horrible job. It is a horrible job. If any of you have ever been executor, you're never going to give the money out fast enough. They're asking and hounding you, when's the estate going to be done? When's the estate going to be done? Can I borrow off the estate? And I'm joking, but in New York, if you have multiple, benef uh, multiple executors, up to three executors can take their own fee. They each gets a statutory fee. After three executors, they share three fees. The fees start at 5% on the first 100 and reduce down to, I think it's 2.5%. For estates over five million, if I'm not mistaken, but I'll give you the exact amount if you want to send it out in an email. But that's different than if you're in New Jersey or if you're in Connecticut. It's always reasonable fees, so you can always kind of. But in your will, if you don't want it to be statutory, you can say that, mm -hmm. and you can say the executor will. You could pick a number. Will serve as executor for ten thousand dollars, and they can accept that or not. Not the executor, you can cap it at a certain amount, or you, could, you know, if you say nothing, they're going to be entitled to it. That doesn't mean they have to take it. So if you name your children or a relative, most times they don't, but sometimes they do. So you know, I just want you to be aware in New York that's actually statutory. Trust fee, trustee fees um, are usually with the institution. 
So if you name Chase, you name City, PIA, whatever, they have their own fee schedule. That is not state specific. That's going to be whoever. If you name a friend, the friend can charge a fee too, if they, you know, a reasonable fee on that. So I wanted you to be aware of that. If you do have charitable inclination, you brought up a good point, you, and you have plenty of retirement accounts, name somebody as, name them a, as a portion or all of the beneficiaries on the retirement accounts, much more tax effective. About what we just talked about with the Secure Act, right? If you want to leave $100,000 for the Red Cross or something, you can always put first $100,000 to Red Cross, remainder two. You can always do that. Now, there's rules about that, and so an attorney may tell you, you know, you have to distribute out the charity within, you know, I think it's 18 months or something. It's usually not that difficult, but there are some rules. But you can do that because, it, I would recommend it because charities don't pay taxes. That's a simple answer. So they're getting the whole hundred versus if you leave it to a non-charity, they got the, either they, they're stretching it out and, you know, making, getting taxed on it, or they're leaving it until 10 years and getting taxed on it. So it's just much more tax effective. If you're redoing your document, never, 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 and I mean that, never, name a charity in the document. I don't like it. It's no, there's no reason other than I see too often people change their minds, right? You know, your father has psoriasis, so you're leaving $100,000 to psoriasis foundation because they helped him along the way. And then fast forward 20 years, you don't have any contact with the psoriasis organization anymore, and you're not really wanting to give them the money. If you named it in your will, right, you have to go back to the attorney, get a codicil, or redo it. If you haven't, you know, updated it in a while, you probably should anyway. But it, my point is people change their mind. If you do it through beneficiary designation, all you probably have to do is go online and take them out, right? So you named it $100,000 to psoriasis, remainder to my you know, children. And you don't want to leave it to psoriasis, you just redo the beneficiary designation and say 100% to my children. You're not going back to an attorney incurring fees to rechange a will. And I, I just see that too often. You know, people move from you know, Alabama to New York they have, you know, Alabama museums named in their will, which they don't have any nexus to anymore. So it's just a tip. I don't like to see them named in there. Um, the specific bequests are a different issue. If you want to leave, you know, money to individuals, that's, that's a different issue. But for charities, I say if you have retirement assets, that's the easiest thing, and it changes it very quickly. Okay, I didn't get past the first slide, did I? I never get past the first slide. Let's go to two. Okay, so we really did talk about a lot of this. So with your last will, they, it, as I said, it goes through probate. You name an executor or a personal representative. Um, if you have minor children, obviously, that name's a guardian. And um, if you don't, your point, if you don't have a will, it goes through intestacy. Every state has their own intestacy laws. So what may be the intestacy laws in New York are probably not the intestacy laws in Connecticut. There are forced um, uh, spousal shares in New York. You can't um, write out, unless you have a prenup or a postnup, you can't write out a spouse. No matter how much you hate them, no matter what you're gonna do, they're gonna fight you tooth and nail because a spouse is entitled to a quarter of your estate. Now, if you, don't, if you have a contentious relationship and you don't want to leave your spouse, you know, a, quarter, a third of your estate outright, you can leave it in a trust for their benefit uh, that qualifies for that third of your estate. And what that would allow you to do is after their death, the trust would distribute it to who you want it to distribute if there are assets left in there. And all that trust has to do is give them all the income. They don't have rights to principal, and that still qualifies for, the, it's called the elective share. That's just a tidbit. I don't think it applies to anyone in this room. I hope it doesn't apply to anyone in this room, but it does have a forced share to the spouse. Revocable trust we just talked about. 
um, making sure if you're using it, what I find a lot of times are people don't um, retitle the assets. They have a beautiful revocable trust, they don't retitle the assets in the name of the revocable trust while they're alive. Make sure if you do that, that you, you do it. You cannot retitle retirement accounts in the name, right? That makes sense, right? Because if you change title on retirement accounts, you're accelerating income taxes. But retirement accounts are gonna avoid probate anyway because they have a beneficiary designation as long as you didn't name the estate. What are the tax consequences of revocable trust? What are the? Nothing. Doesn't save you taxes and it's nothing. It still has your social security. That's, that's an irrevocable trust. That's an irrevocable trust, not a revocable. Revocable trusts have no income tax benefits. They still have your social security number. You're still gonna be taxed on all the dividends from the bank accounts, everything. It's a flow through, but it avoids probate. That's all it does, okay? Oh, so for all of you wealthy people in this room, and that does not include me, let me tell you, the exemption from federal taxes each of you have this year is $11,580,000. And it's what's called portable, which means if you have a married couple and you leave everything to the surviving spouse, which is what most of us do, right? You really haven't used this exemption because this exemption is for assets that pass to a spouse, your children, for example, your nieces, your nephews, your friends. So if everything passes to the spouse, you haven't used it, the surviving spouse gets the deceased spouse exemption. So for a married couple, you have over $23 million, you will pay no federal estate tax if it's $23 million or below. So I dare say most of us will not be subject to federal estate tax. Although I hope the few of you that are, you raise your hand. <laughs> Pardon me? How about the state tax? The state tax is where all of you are probably gonna have some liability. And that's because the estate tax rate is half of this. The estate tax exemption is half of this. New York's exemption this year is $5,150,000. It's not portable. So if you die and your estate doesn't use it, you lose it. And even worse than that, if your estate is own over 5% of this amount, which is around 6 million, you lose the benefit of the entire exemption and you're taxed from dollar one. You're shaking your head, you know that. And New York's uh, estate tax is pretty onerous, it goes up to percent. Um, it's an incremental scale and it goes up to 16%. Uh, so if your estate and your estate is everything you own, your house, your retirement assets, your bank accounts, everything that you own add up to more than what this exemption is, then you have to do some planning. And what, the way you do and eliminate the tax is that at the first death, instead of the surviving spouse taking everything, you create a portion of that in a trust for the spouse's benefit. The spouse can even be their own trustee. It's very liberal, but that's called a credit exemption trust, but you're capturing some of that New York exemption at the first death, and it's not included. Whatever's in there will not be included in the surviving spouse's estate at the time of their death. So there's some trust planning you can do, but if you're in that situation where your estate is over this exemption amount, you should see an attorney to do some tax planning. You can still have a document that leaves everything to the, uh, to the surviving spouse with the right to disclaim. That's another way of doing it. Instead of making it mandatory that that credit shelter trust be funded to some extent, you can give the surviving spouse the ability to look at the tax situation at the time of their death and determine if they want to keep all those assets or if they want to disclaim. 
Now, if you disclaim, you have to do that within nine months of the decedent's death. But it's good tax planning because it adds to flexibility, and I always like flexibility. I mean, in the unlikely event that New York does away with their estate tax, you know, you'd never disclaim. But, or if you move to Florida, they don't have an estate tax, you'd never disclaim. You'd move to New Jersey, they don't have an estate tax. You'd never have to disclaim. You never probably would disclaim. But if the laws are as they are today, or you move to Massachusetts, which has worse taxes than New York. You know, Massachusetts has a $1 million exemption. Yeah, they're the worst. There and Oregon, believe it or not. Or somebody told me I say it wrong. It's Oregon. Oregon, Oregon right? If you're from Oregon, I said it wrong. It's Oregon, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, somebody corrected me on that. Um, they have a $1 million exemption, too. California, no estate tax. Believe it or not, no estate tax. Okay, so we went over portability. Now, with portability, just so, it, and this is an FYI, not that you'd ever have to know this, your attorney will know this, but you have to actually make the election. To, to say, yes, I want portability. There's actually a form on the death, uh, last, last estate tax return, the 706, where you elect it. These are the states that have estate taxes. The ones in blue, see Oregon, one million. Washington has two million plus of exemption. Uh, Illinois has four million exemption. Minneapolis has three, New York 5.85. Um, one of the worst states, believe it or not, besides Massachusetts and Oregon is uh, Ma Maryland. Maryland has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax. Now, whether you're going to be subject to them or not, but they have both taxes on that. Um, inheritance taxes. The difference between a state tax and, and shut me up whenever you want. I could go on forever. The difference between a state tax and inheritance tax. New York has an estate tax. It's based on what the size of your estate is. So you look at personal property, you look at cars, homes, everything added up. You, they'll give you a, a, a you know a percentage that you get taxed on, and that's your state tax. They have an exemption. You get an exemption, and then you're taxed on the rest. An inheritance tax is taxed on who inherits. So in other words, in Pennsylvania, children are actually subject to an inheritance tax. It's the only state, it's bizarre. So spouse is not, but when spouse dies and leaves assets to children, they're subject to an estate tax, I think, uh, inheritance tax, I think it's at 4%, but it can be significant. So an inheritance tax is levied on who inherits, and estate tax is levied on the sides of the estate and whatever the state has as, as their brackets for being subject to it. Anything else on that? Uh, here are the, here's the list of everything. The only states that have portability right now I'm aware of is Hawaii. So if anyone wants to join me, we can go to Hawaii um, yeah, see, state portability is allowed, but that's the only, you know, and they have the high exemption um, that, that we do. And then these are all like adjusted for inflation. Uh, disclaimer planning, we talked about it. If you leave everything to the surviving spouse, you don't have to take it. You never have to take an inheritance. You can always disclaim. Now, if you, you can even disclaim retirement assets. So if you named your spouse as the uh, beneficiary of a retirement asset and the children is contingent, that's, that's typical what I see. If the spouse disclaims retirement assets or a portion of them, it will go to the contingent beneficiary. So if it's the children, it will go to the children. If it's the credit shelter trust, it will go to the credit shelter trust. So not only are beneficiaries important, contingent beneficiaries are important too, because then you can do some tax planning. One of the thoughts with the SECURE Act actually is instead of leaving everything to the surviving spouse, 
the retirement asset, right? And having the spouse stretch it over and then leaving it to non-spouse children, for example. Some people are talking about at the first death, leave some of those retirement assets to the children, which starts a 10 year period, right? And then when you pass away, the remaining retirement assets, that would begin another 10 year period. So what you're doing is that's, that's income tax planning. So instead of the child getting everything at once, they're, they're actually spreading it out maybe over 20 years versus 10. That's, that's a thought that some people have had with the SECURE Act. I have to run the numbers on that. I did it and it didn't make sense to me, but um, I think it does if you're gonna have an estate tax, then you know getting some assets out of your estate may make some sense. Um, but, and I think if you have older people where they may not, the stretch may not be that long, that may make some sense. But it, it, you really have to look at the situation, I think, be, before that I would recommend that to anyone. We talked about powers of attorney. You should have power of attorney. Uh, that's for uh, financial matters. The banks now accept them, which is important, so make sure they're up, Chase, make sure they're up to date. And that allows, you know, you can do it in New York, it's the only state that can have a gift rider on it. So you can, you can always put it in a power of attorney, but New York actually has a separate gift rider that you can add to your will, uh, to your power of attorney that allows the person to make not only annual gifts, but you can make gifts in excess of that amount if you want. Uh, living wills, healthcare profit, proxies, those are the, I can't feed myself, I can't eat on my own, who's gonna have that ability to you know, make sure, you know, DNR, those kind of things. So you may wanna have those. If you have these, make sure the person that you're giving that power to knows A, that they're the person that you gave the power to, and B, where it is. And make sure they have a copy of that because that's, that's actually very important too. Um, we, we talked about gifts. Um, you can give $15,000 a year now to anyone for any reason. And the spelling of my name is a little complicated, so if you, if you need it, I'll be more than happy to spell it out for you. Um, you can give, uh, spouses can give 30,000 to anyone. You, and you probably all know paying for education, your tuition, uh, medical bills, if you pay directly, that does not impede on the gifting. So if you have a grandchild, a child that's getting braces, you can pay for the braces and, it w and still give them uh, 15,000. Uh, if you're doing, mm -hmm. I understand that you can give more than it would be deducted from her exemption. Exactly, you can give really up to 11,580. It just comes off your exemption. So lifetime gifting is always good. If you go over the 15, I have to file a gift tax return. But the gift tax return is 709, IRS 709. But all it is is informational. It's just gonna say on February 28th, I gave $100,000 to my son, right? And then when you pass away, what happens is, yeah, they'll go, what's your estate? Did you make gifts? You'll say yes, how much was it? 100. The benefit of giving lifetime gifts is any appreciation gets out of your estate to whoever you gave the money to. So it's an estate fees technique. Uh -huh. If you're gonna do tuition, do you give it directly to the college? Yes. You don't give it to the child? No, no, you pay directly to. So you negotiate the with the college? Pardon me? You negotiate with the college? <laughs> yeah, you could, I guess. Sure, sure. Whatever you wanna do, you can do on that. And then this is what we were talking about. You can go above this 15, uh, it just needs to whatever the exemption was. So I think everybody now has plenty of exemptions, so it's not as big a deal as it used to be. Other than the fact that you may not be aware of the uh, annual exclusion is 15,000. It's been that way for a few years, right? That only goes up per thousand. So it doesn't go up with inflation. 
it, the next time it goes up, it's going to be 16,000. So it, it isn't 15,500, 15,250, whatever. It only goes up in increments of $1,000. That's why for a long time it was 14, and then it, it, then it was 15 for I think three years, and the next leap on that will be uh, at 16,000 a year. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is not on this topic, but a year ago on the phone, people at both TIAA and Vanguard said that my beneficiaries or whoever deals with the will will need to know my social security number to collect. I'm the sorry, they have to know your social security TIAA number? TIAA retirement account. To collect it, the beneficiary needs to know my social security number, they said. Is that accurate? Your beneficiary needs to know your social security number. Yeah. I, 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 you stumped me on that one. And that's hard to do. But you did stump me on that one. So you're saying you can't name? Well, I'm, I'm, does my beneficiary, who tends to lose everything, need to know my social I mean, um, they. Well, I guess if you don't know the answer, that no. Yeah. I don't um, know that one, I'm and sorry. And should Will speak, I mean, my lawyer said I should just keep my will at home, she doesn't keep it. Where do wills usually get kept? Your will, make sure somebody knows where it is, and oh. if you lock it up, make sure they have the combination. I, I wouldn't put it in a bank unless, you know, a safety deposit box. Because again, maybe Chase has been better on safety deposit boxes. Can't you can't. You can't get in, so don't, yeah, don't put your will in a safety deposit box. That's, that's kind of a losing situation, but I don't know about the other. We can talk later. Yeah, we can talk later on that. Um, so different strategies, and I'm going to go over these fast because I know you guys can't talk, listen to me anymore. Um, I just wanted to go over some trends. Disclaimer planning we talked about. You never have to take an inheritance. If you don't want it, you want to do tax planning, you want it to go to whoever is the contingent beneficiary, you can do a disclaimer. Written piece of paper, your attorney will do it. Written piece of paper where you say, I don't want this piece of property, and it will go to, if it's a beneficiary, it'll go to the contingent beneficiary. If it's in the will, it'll go to your second beneficiary there or the surviving, however it's worded. But disclaimer planning adds a lot of flexibility. Some attorneys like it, some don't. I mean, that's, that, 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 it, it depends on whether your attorney likes it. I personally like it because it gives the most flexibility. Um, generation skipping planning. If you have someone that you're worried about, um, maybe you have a beneficiary that's very wealthy. They hit the lottery or they're very hard, industrious. They live in Silicon Valley and they have more money than they'll ever need. But you don't want to write them out of the will, right? Because they are, you know, your blood and everything. You could have them inherit what's called a generation skipping trust. What a generation skipping trust does is it does not skip your beneficiary. It skips the tax associated with that trust when your beneficiary passes away. So let's just say you have a child that's very successful, they live in California, they don't need the money, but you have two other children. You divide your estate into three parts. They each have what's called a generation skipping trust. It can be very liberal, it can be very restrictive. Let's assume it's very liberal, they get all income, principal for health, education, maintenance, and support. Most restrictive would be income principal and trustees discretion. Let's just say this is very liberal. You let the two children that need the money, they want to build a house, they want to, you know, they have children, they want to pay for education, they can dip into that. Income principal for health, education, maintenance, support. Very liberal. But the third child doesn't need it. It can grow, 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 grow. When those children pass away, if a dollar's left in those trusts, or it, the one child grows to 10 million, whatever's in there will pass to their children with no federal taxes, no New York taxes, 
no state taxes no matter where they live. That's the generation skipping tax benefit. So it provides asset protection. If their child got divorced, if the child got sued, those assets, if they inherit in a trust, and it doesn't even have to be generation, but if they inherit in a trust, then those assets would be protected from lawsuits, anything bad that could happen if they're structured properly. So they're very powerful too. Um, Multi-generational income tax planning, that's where we talked about with the generation skipping trust. Grantor retained annuity, I'm just gonna talk about two other ideas you may want. If your estate is gonna hit that New York, right? But you don't wanna give all your money away, obviously. There are some things that can maybe, or maybe you're right at that level. Grantor retained annuity trust is something that you may wanna consider. Grantor retained annuity trust is a trust. And what the government says is usually I make these two year trusts. And let's just say you take a million dollars, and I'm only using a million because it's an easy number for me to remember. When you set up the trust, the government tells you how much interest you have to make on that money before it's considered a gift, okay? Interest rates are extremely low now. I think the interest rate on a, 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 a three-year trust, which is short term, the AFR rate, applicable federal rate, I think is a 1.8 this month, okay? If you set up the trust this month and the applicable federal rate, let's just say it's 2%, just to make it easy. Uh, it's that rate stays with the trust for the trust term. If you make it a two-year trust, you can zero it out by in the first year, you contributed a million dollars you take back 500,000, it's a grantor trust, you're the grantor. You take back half of the principal you donated, or you, you contributed, 500,000 plus 2.2, uh, plus 2%, whatever the applicable federal rate is. If you're investing in stocks and they earn 6%, that additional 4%, that excess stays in there. Then in the second year, it's a two year trust, you take out your other 500, so you haven't made a gift. You've gotten all your million back, and you take out another 2.2, and you earn six, that's an additional four in there. And then the beneficiaries of that trust, that excess, can be your children, your friends, whatever. So it's not a home run, but it is a base hit, in that it's freezing the value. The growth on that million isn't in your estate, it's actually going to the next generation with no gift tax. So that's something you may want to consider. The other one, and I gave an example here we can talk about, is a spousal limited access trust. And what you're doing in that is setting up simultaneous trusts for each spouse. So you may set up a $2 million trust over here and a $1 million trust over here. The, the husband sets it up for the, the spouse over here. They have access to the income during their lifetime. So what happens is, even though it's a completed gift, you actually, the family unit, has the ability to use that money. And that's one of the few trusts that you actually can make an irrevocable gift and still have use of that money. And then the other spouse does it for the other spouse's benefit. So husband does one for wife, wife does one for husband. and when the beneficiary dies, either the spouse or the husband, it goes down to the kids. The only reason you might be considering doing something like this, more heavy duty gifting, is New York actually doesn't have a gift tax, but they have a three year rule. If you make a gift, you can't do bedtime death bequests in New York. If you do gifts, you have to survive three years before they're out of your estate for New York. So you may want to think about things that you can do and survive the three-year ter three term so that they're permanently out of your estate, right? Because if not, everything's going to become, you can't like on your deathbed say, okay, I'm giving my house to my son. You can't do that, okay? 
And then I think we talked about income taxes last time. This is uh, all the income taxes and the changes in the income taxes. Uh, Long-term capital gain now are not ac according to brackets, it's according to income. So if you're married, 80,000, 80, if you're single, 40,000, there's no capital gains, no capital gains tax anymore. So you can do some planning there with different generations. Uh, look at this, the difference here. Um, from 40,000 to 441,000, you're still in the 15% bracket. And then over that, you're in the 20% bracket. So it's still very beneficial to have long-term capital gain. Most of us are not going to be able to itemize anymore because the standard deduction doubled. Um, and we lost a lot of them. Mortgage interest is capped now at 750000 of total acquisition debt. Uh, charitable deductions actually were one of the few that got a bump up. It used to be 50% for cash, now it's 60% for cash. Medical expenses are 10% of adjusted gross income. A lot of us won't hit that, thank goodness. And state and local taxes, as we all unfortunately know, are capped at 10,000, the SALT deduction. Uh, we don't get any miscellaneous deductions anymore. So there's very few of us that will itemize. One way you may want to consider itemizing if you are at all charitably inclined is to bunch up your charitable deductions in a donor advised fund so it goes over the 24 if you're married or 12 if you're single. And then in the other year, and with a donor advised fund, you don't have to give the money out the year. You get the deduction the year you set it up, the year you contribute, but you don't have to give a penny to charity. You can wait until you even pass away. But if you bunch it up and get over that exemption amount, um, you can itemize in that year. And then the other years, you just take the regular itemized deduction or a standard deduction. <laughs> the other thing I don't know if any of you are doing are the qualified charitable distributions. You're all nodding your head. You're aware of those. That stayed at 70 and a half. It, it didn't increase with the 72, so you can still do that. For those of you that don't know what they are, you can deduct, uh, it's not a deduction, you can use up to $100,000 of your required minimum distribution, give it directly to charity. It's not included in income and you don't get a deduction for it. Uh, each spouse can do that. Yes. No, it, yeah, it, it, you only have 100. Yeah, you wouldn't get the benefit of that. And the other thing I get sometimes, question I get sometimes is, I took my RMD and now I want to do one. Your RMD is still going to be taxable. You can't retro and apply it retro. You, you can do it. You can always give to charity, but you can't uh, take it. And I think that's it. A lot of these provisions that we talked about sunset. Uh, 2026, a lot's going to depend on who's in government, what, our go you know, what the deficit is, etc. So none of these usually turn on a dime. It's usually, I get this a lot, well, I wonder if the Democrats get in and, you know, I haven't taken advantage. A lot of these are, are at least in my lifetime, they'll give you a period of time, like if it, it will start January 1st. So if you wanted to take advantage of some of these larger deductions, you could do it within a period of time. Now, your attorney may be busy, <laughs> but that's a different issue. But usually it's not, it's not retroactive. And I think that's it. Thank you.